well, this heat has everyone tripping, right? It has the, 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 the technology going crazy. It's the most I've ever seen fans waving in here, but it's all beautiful. It's all good. I ask that you would turn to Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28, and we'll be looking at just one verse this morning, uh, verse 13 from Proverbs 28. The word of the living God. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. Let me say it another way. Whoever covers his sin will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Let's ask the Lord for help. Lord, our gracious God, we, Lord, know the weakness of the flesh. We know the frailty of the mind, Lord. Even in a hot room, Lord, our minds are tempted to wander and tempted to be more concerned with the heat rather than even your word. So I pray that you would help us to redirect our affections uh, to where they belong, Lord, during this hour of worship. And that is upon your word as it unveils the beauty of Christ for our good and for your glory. Lord, please accomplish this through the feeble foolishness of preaching, Lord. But you've ordained it as such, so it's glorious to us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, what would you say is the root cause of what hinders the mission of God on earth? Uh, many times I think that in the society that we have all grown up in, we are more likely to attribute the hindrances of life to something external, right? To society, to, to, to culture, that we say that, well, families are struggling, struggling because of something outside the family. Uh, churches are struggling because of something outside the church. Uh, marriages are struggling because of, of, of social norms that have, that have crept in from outside, right? It, we always think it's something outside of us, something that's influencing us, something uh, in the culture itself, something externalized, Right? And culture is externalized religion, make no mistake. But we, whatever the culture is, is stewing doesn't mean that we need to take that in and let it shape us and let it uh, truly uh, uh, cause us to conform to it, especially when the culture is not honoring Christ. So what truly hinders individuals, families, marriages, churches, the kingdom of, of God in general on earth? It's sin, church. It is sin every single time. Now, what we need to see here is that uh, sin is, is really not just sin in and of itself, but it's sin that's not dealt with, right? Everyone in this room, probably today, most likely, and I would say, yes, today, sinned at some point already. So what's the difference between your sin and your sin and your... Uh, it's the one who deals with it. It's the one who's actually dealing with their sin, right? Uh, as, as you've heard the expression, everyone's house gets dirty. Uh, everyone's house has clutter. What's the difference between a messy house and a clean home? A clean home? Someone deals with it in the clean home. Uh, the, those messes are picked up. The, uh, it's not left just to continue to pile up and pile up and pile up. No, the difference between healthy churches and non-healthy churches healthy families and non-healthy families is not the reality of sin itself. It's who's dealing with the sin. Who's actually bringing that sin uh, and confessing it to God and cleaning up the mess in Him as it were? A sin that is not dealt with will always grow. I heard one pastor say, uh, is it hard to grow weeds? Not weed, Californians. Weeds, okay? <laughs> is it hard to grow weeds? And, uh, do, do you need soil? Uh, are you out there watering the weeds to make sure that they grow? I, I've seen weeds growing through concrete cracks. Right? I've seen weeds growing on telephone poles, and you think, how did it get up there, right? They're just a strange reality of the power of weeds. That's what sin is like, right? It doesn't need to be, um, as it were, in the rich soil. No, the weeds grow in the poor soil of our heart, right? Sin is like that. Left unchecked, sin will devour everything in its path. Left unchecked, sin will grow in the good garden of God that he has called you. So what we need to see here in our text and what we need to see in day-to-day -day life is the question isn't whether there will be sin. It's what will we do when sin is there, evident before us. The question isn't whether your marriage will have sin. It's what will you do with that sin. The question isn't whether your, sin, your, your children will sin. Newsflash, Christian parents, your children will sin. What do you do when they sin? How do you handle that sin? So again, our text here in Proverbs is highlighting what we must do when sin is there. 
A quick word on the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is obviously known as wisdom literature. It's not necessarily, um, you know, you, if you do these things, it'll automatically be the case uh, that it'll come out for you in the other, on the other side. It isn't put a quarter in and you get something out of it, right? These are the principles of God that most likely end up being the case. For instance, you see some Proverbs that say that the hardworking will always be rich, as it were, and the poor will always be as a, ro uh, a result of laziness. Is that always the case? Aren't there some people who are really hardworking, but yet they're still poor? Are there some people that are uh, really lazy, and yet they're rich? Yes, so it's not a one-for-one -one perfect every single time, but in God's world, these Proverbs tend to be the case. It tends to be the case that when you train, a, train up a child in the way that he should go, he will not depart from it, right? So we're not going to downplay these Proverbs and say, oh, they don't really happen. No, they actually tend to happen, right? Most of the time, this is the case. Uh, most of the time, these Proverbs truly are uh, a template for all of life, and we don't trust in the proverb itself. We trust in the God of the Proverbs who said this word. So here we see in our text, let's read it one more time, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. Another uh, translation, whoever covers his sin will not prosper. Let's look at this word transgression or sin. What is sin? The Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 14, rightly states that sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Any want to transgress the law. So even, even a desire to want to do it in and of itself, here we see, is a, is a sin and a transgression of the law of God. And what properly defined is the law of God? Well, the Bible uh, in and days gone by was called the law word of God because what God says is law every single time so if you want to find out what sin is you have to know what the law is and if you want to know what the law is you have to read your Bibles uh, not what scripture uh, sorry what, what culture is saying sin is or society is saying that sin is no we need to find out what scripture says sin is First John says this, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. All wrongdoing is sin. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So when you are asking the question of what is sin, you have to know your word, right? Otherwise, it'll just be subjective differences between one another. And a quick caution, as Christians, we must never call anything a sin that God does not call a sin. Would you dare place your standard higher than God's own standard? No, that's where we get into the Romans 14 issues where we begin to label things as sin that aren't sin in and of themselves. No, uh, we need to make sure that we go to God's word, know God's word, understand the standard to find out what sin is. Right? If we're going to deal with sin, we must know what it is. That's the problem. A lot of times, we don't know what sin is, so we never deal with it. And we just chalk it up to, oh, we just have differences. Oh, maybe there's actually sin there. Oh, my, 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 my child just gets hyper around this time of night. Maybe there's actually sin there, right? Oh, society just tends to, maybe there's actually sin there. But we don't know what sin is anymore, so we don't know how to rightly see it. And if we can't see it, we can't confess it. If we can't confess it, we don't have prosperity, and we don't have mercy, and we don't have goodness. So it's imperative, church, that we would be a Bible-reading church, a Bible-loving church. It's imperative that you, for yourself and for your family, would stick your nose in the Word often, together. This is the great mirror that God has given you to look into to see what you're really like, to see uh, how, the, how, how God defines you, uh, what God thinks of certain things to show you what you ought to do, what you ought not to do. Uh, it's, it's the word of God. It's not my standard. It's not Christianity's standard. It's God's standard. So we see here, again, whoever covers his sin, whoever conceals his sin, will not prosper. What did Adam do in the garden? What's the first thing Adam did? He covered his sin. He blamed the woman or he blamed God who gave him the woman. Right? He first went outside of himself and thought that it was something that was uh, uh, put upon him rather than seeing it was his own sin. And what did Adam and Eve do thereafter? They wanted to cover their own sin. And so they got these little, these little leaves and covered themselves because they were ashamed of that sin. There was real shame there. Right? Uh, shame is not a bad thing. We should be sh ashamed of sin. Uh, we should be, uh, have, have a sense of, of shame for when we fall into sin. 
uh, Adam and Eve knew the shame and they wanted to cover themselves, to clean themselves up. And they had no prosperity there. God will not prosper in a true sense anyone or any movement that covers their sin. So church, perhaps we find ourselves in the state that we find ourselves in the world, in California, in Southern California, even in the churches of Southern California, because we're not confessing our sin. We're actually covering our sin. We're concealing our sin. We're not dealing with our sin. Perhaps you're not knowing the, the, the true prosperity of a Christian family, of a Christian culture, because there's sin in the culture. There's sin in our families. A quick note on Christian culture. I think it's the funniest thing that people knock on Christian culture, and yet where are all these Christians moving to? Where there's still a semblance of Christian culture. Uh, why do they want to go to red states? Because there's a sense of Christian culture there. So it's not a bad thing to desire a Christian culture. It's not enough. We need true regen uh, regenerate hearts. But Christian culture is something that we, we should be seeking after. But there's sin in the culture that's not being confessed. In fact, the sin in the culture is being confirmed by the church. We hear your trauma. Oh, we know you struggle with sexual identity. Oh, woman, go be your own boss. The church herself is affirming these things, the so-called church. How are we ever going to go back to the ways of the Lord when the church that should be the voice of reason and, and a prophetic voice to the world is the one affirming the world? Because we want the world's approval rather than us having the Lord's approval and standing boldly in that. So God will never bless anyone who covers their own sin, nor any movement that covers their own sin. Remember, Christ covers our sin. What did God do for Adam and Eve when he saw their petty little covering? Get that out of here. And he, what did he do? He got animals and he killed animals and covered Adam and Eve in a covering that was with a blood sacrifice to hide their shame. And it's been the same ever since. It's been the same ever since for us. Christ's blood covers us. Christ's righteousness covers us. Adam and Eve wanted their own covering, and God sacrificed something for them instead. So don't cover your own sin. No, confess your sin. Let the Lord cover his, your sin for you. There's no need to cover when we have a covering in Christ. And it goes on to say here in the second half of our, ver uh, of our verse, but he who confesses and forsakes them, that, that is the sin, will obtain mercy. Forsake is obviously a, another picture of repentance. Whoever looks at the sin, confesses it, and forsakes it, and turns away from it, uh, will obtain mercy, will have mercy, right? But again, it begins with confession of sin. I always tell my children, you cannot repent of something that you've not first confessed. It's almost impossible. Because how are you going to rightly forsake something that you're not calling it for what it is? So, not dealing with sin is the big issue here. Remember, the issue isn't, do we sin? All of us sin, church. All of us have ongoing battles with the flesh. It's just part of remaining uh, with this old flesh upon us, that body of death, as it were. But what we see here is that we need to clearly deal with sin. We don't avoid it. We don't let it uh, fester. We, uh, we, we, we don't coddle sin. We don't defend sin. We don't justify sin. No, no, we need to deal with it. We don't want to get comfortable with sin, okay? We all have that one chair, mostly in, in bedrooms, that becomes the outdoor closet, right? Uh, you know, here's, here's, that, here's that, that, that shirt, here's the pants. They got three more uses in them. I know they do, okay? Uh, he, here, here's the shirt again, okay? And you put it on the next day, here's the shirt, and then other kids start, oh, well, this is, the, this is that chair to stack all our old clothes on, right? And then it just becomes that chair. It becomes that drawer. It becomes that closet that you don't want anyone to see. Why? Because you're getting comfortable with it. Because it's starting to become so part of your daily life. It's just that chair. It's just that closet. Don't treat your sin that way. Oh, it's just 9.30 p.m. And, uh, you know, I know what I do at 9.30 p.m. Oh, it's just on, on my way home to, to hang out with the boys for a little bit. And I know what I do then. Right? And in your spouse, don't begin to just say, my spouse is just that way. Oh, it's that time, right? They haven't eaten for a couple of hours. I'll excuse that anger, right? 
or in your children, whatever it is, we cannot get comfortable with sin. We cannot have those closets of sin that we just know are there and we just leave them to be. No, that's how you grow numb to sin. That's how your conscience becomes seared. And then later on you think, how is this room that started with the chair covered in clothes? Am I a hoarder or something? And then you look at your life and you say, how did I go from this sin and now I'm completely overtaken by the weeds of this sin that I can't even recognize my own life? I'm telling you, church, you have no idea how many times I've met with Christians who, at, who are at the, the, the end of the road, as it were, and they tell me, I don't know how I ended up here. I just knew that one day I started taking the things of the Lord less serious. I just knew that one day I let that little sin fester too long, coddle too long, defend it too long. Do not get comfortable with sin. Instead, keep short accounts with sin. Confess your sin. Confess it right away. And the word confess in scripture actually just means to repeat the same thing, okay? What does that mean? Does it mean that we just overly and over, over and over again say the same thing? No, it means that whatever the sin was, we must repeat the sin as God would see the sin. For instance, when you've had a long day and you burst out on your children, the sin isn't, I had a long day. The sin is, I was short-tempered and I need forgiveness. We need to call sin what God calls sin, right? It's not, um, it's not enough for us to just acknowledge that something was wrong. No, we need to confess the sin as God would see the sin in order for us to truly deal with that sin. So it's not being hangry, it's being quick to anger. It's not being tired, it's being uh, quick to anger. It's not um, a, a you uh, just having a long day, it's you being impatient. It's not just you glancing over at that, you know, image too long, it's adultery. It's, it's not you just uh, saying that your marriage has uh, every, uh, um, uh, differences that can't be reconciled. No, it's that you need to confess that your marriage is harboring sin, that your marriage has bitterness at the root of it. You need to confess sin in the words that God calls that sin. So you need to confess if your marriage is in shambles. I once heard a story of a couple that would agree every time that the pastor was going to visit their house, they agreed to put their best face on. Okay, he's coming over tonight. Just pretend that we're good. Did that for years. Sad to say that couple is no longer married. It's a sad reality. Why? Because they didn't confess their sin. They covered their sin. Confess if you have a porn problem. Confess if you are a disorderly father. Confess if you're a nagging wife. Confess if you are a child who keeps secrets from your parents. Confess if you are a child who's uh, poor friends to your friends. Confess these things. Go to the individual, confess it to them, ask them for forgiveness, and take it to the Lord and deal with it. Do not get used to it. Don't excuse it. Don't justify it. And don't give half-hearted confessions of sin. Well, I know I was angry, but you did this. Let the Lord deal with that side. Well, I know I did this, but don't forget your part. Let the Lord deal with that side. We need to repeat as it is in our text to confess as it is seen by God. In fact, that's why we practice confession of sin here in our worship service. Really, all our worship service is for us to repeat this Monday through Saturday. Every day you should call your hearts to worship. Every day you should confess your sin. Every day you should remind yourself of the consecration that you have to God through his word. And every, every day, as it were, you should commune with your God. And so confession of sin is just getting you in the very normal practice of confessing sin to your God. You don't need to go to a little booth and confess it to a guy in a funny outfit. No, you can confess it straight to God. Right? You can confess it to him, and he hears your confession, and he hears that cry, and you receive mercy. You receive grace. You receive truly the assurance of pardon. We're training ourselves through this liturgy for all of life to become liturgical, for all of life to share this goodness. And listen to the beautiful words that we find in 1 John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful promise of God, church. And we see it in our text. We find mercy. We obtain mercy. So there, there it is, right? There's the stench of sin in your life. 
There's the stench of sin, right, on your clothes. Remember in the old PE days when the boys would just play a bunch of hours in the park and they would get that axe, they shh all over themselves, thinking that they were covering their sin? Just put a different shirt on, right? Just, just let go of that and go about your day. There you are with all that sin, and you just get all the acts that you can get instead of confessing it to God, who promises to cleanse you of it. If you have an ongoing battle with sin, it's probably because you haven't truly confessed it to God. You truly haven't brought it to Him. Because what I see in the Word of God is when we bring Him our sin, when we confess our sin, we're cleansed of all unrighteousness. But what do you do? You want to cleanse yourself with that axe. Okay, okay. I got it, Lord. This time, for real. I'm legit. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give in. Okay, Lord, this time, I'm not going to be grumpy. I'm not going to be grouchy. Okay, Lord, this time, I'm not going to look at that website. Whatever it is, uh, this time is different. Okay, Lord, I'm going to wake up early every morning to, 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 to really uh, uh, read my word. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. You're trying to clean yourself up. When God says, confess your sin, he'll clean you up. He'll give you the grace. He will give you the mercy, right? Don't try to clean yourself up to obtain it. He does the cleaning. He does the cleansing. Your job is to truly, with heart unveiled, confess your sin to him and let him deal with it. Remember, the difference is not, do we have sin? The difference is not uh, different households being clean or not clean. No, the difference is who is cleaning their household? Who is dealing with their sin? And that's so beautiful for us to maintain as Christians because what tends to happen in some uh, you know, pietistic reform circles, it's almost like you can't even confess sin anymore. Oh, brother, you're struggling with that? Yes, that's why I'm telling you, <laughs> right? You can't even deal with sin anymore because it's almost like a taboo to say that you still battle the flesh. You know what I would love for us to just be honest with, you, with each other, right? There's verses that, that, that speak about having no guile when you confess your sin, having no deception when you confess your sin, having no lie. Why? Because we do not want the confession of sin. We don't want sin um, uh, rearing its ugly face in our church to be something taboo. It happens. And then when we treat it as taboo, guess what's going to happen? You're going to cover it because you don't want to be the one guy in the strong brotherhood of men that's dealing with this sin. We all deal with it. We all must confess it. And we even will kill it together. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. So again, the question is, it, do our houses get dirty? Yes, they always do. Dishes always pile up. Uh, there's always laundry to do. But who's doing the laundry? Who's actually getting to the dishes? Don't just throw up your hands and say, we lose against sin. We lose against the flesh. This war is hopeless. No, we're not under sin's dominion any longer. We're not under the bondage to the flesh. Christ's death freed us from bondage to the flesh. Not just the punishment of sin, but the power of sin over us. You know, the reason that I'm post-mill is because I see what God does in my own life. There's a progressive sanctification in my life, as it should be in all of the believers' life in this room. There should be a progressive sanctifying work of God. And all I do is I see that and I say, well, the, true, the, the same is true of the world. God, God is progressively sanctifying the world. And so you should know true Christian victory. Why don't you? You don't, you don't confess your sin. The very first step of victory is confessing that sin. So, as I said before, keep short accounts. Keep short accounts with your wife. Keep short accounts with your children. Teach your children to keep short accounts with you as their parents. Keep short accounts with one another. Keep short accounts. Bitterness loves to grow in the soil of festering, ongoing, delay, delayed sin. It loves to grow there. You know, th th that's probably where it grows the best. All that bitterness, all that hatred, all that ugliness. So if you have to confess sin today, do it. If there's a sin that you have today, do it. Take it to the Lord, confess it to him, name it as it is, and watch God do the work. Watch God clean you. Watch God cleanse you. Watch God give you mercy and grace. That's how God works. That's how God prospers us, all in Christ. Later on in 1 John, after that verse I just read, this is what we read. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. 
But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. Not only ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Did you catch that? Scripture knows you're going to keep on battling sin. So when you do fall into sin, don't forget that sin is paid for. That sin has already had a propitious act upon it, meaning that God has already been satisfied with the sacrifice on behalf of that sin. But you think God wants to punish your sin, but he's already punished that in Christ. So you don't bring it to him because you're scared. But the beauty is, if he's dealt with it in Christ, he already knows about it, so bring it to him. We have an advocate in Christ, his perfect life, his perfect covering, his blood that washes us. We have truly a union with Christ, and so we live all of life in the name of Christ. We sing in Jesus. We confess our sin in Jesus. We have assurance of pardon in Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. That's where God blesses us. When we see ourselves blessed in Christ, not hindered by the sin that so easily entangles us. So here we are, all of us, trying to run this race. Here we are, all of us, trying to live out the mission of God on earth. Here we are trying to run this marathon, and we're wearing 200-pound weight vest while we do it. We're wearing that sin as we do it. You ever see someone confess sin? It's like a weight is lifted off their shoulders. Why do you think that is? Because a weight is literally lifted on their shoulders. Christ carries the load of sin for us. He's already done it if you're in Christ. Your sins are already forgiven in Christ. What are you doing holding on to that sin? What are you doing running a marathon with the weight of sin that was put upon the back of Christ? Why are, why are you trying to be your own Christ? Do not cover your sin. Do not hide your sin. Do not conceal your sin. Don't carry your sin. As I said before, maybe this is why God does not prosper his people. So as we look into our application and we just confess, confess some sins that we see out in the culture, we might see in our own hearts, we might see in our own marriages, knowing we're doing this, not as a, how dare you sinners. That's not the way we preach here. It's look at us, redeemed by the blood of God. So as we name some sins, no, there's no sin that is uncommon to man by which even our Lord was not tempted by so when there's the sin of lethargy in the fight, when there's the sin of being a sluggard, when there's a slin of, uh, the, the, the sin of self-mastery, uh, a lack of self-mastery, a lack of self-discipline, uh, uh, when there's a, a sin of gluttony, a, a sin of, of the poverty gospel, when there's a sin in marriages of withholding from one another, harshness with one another, when there's a sin uh, from fathers who are lazy and disconnected and don't lead family worship, when there's a sin of being a naggy, continual dripping faucet of a wife, a short-tempered wife, a grouchy wife, uh, uh, when there's these sins, we don't need to be scared of them. We need to own them and say, yeah, that's me. Lord, clean me up. Lord, here it is. Do what you say you do when I bring this sin to you. All right, Lord, I'm confessing it to you so that you can cleanse me from it. When there's sin in our children and the way that they might treat each other or treat our, treat our friends, and that's highlighted, don't be mad at the person that brought it up. Talk to your children. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. It's a good teaching lesson nonetheless. Deal with the sin. God gives us forms of discipline for our children to not buy into the psychological jargon that's all lies in our culture. Deal with sin the way God has taught us to deal with sin. When there's sin in the church, the sin of slander, gossip, or just this victimhood mentality, that needs to be highlighted. You don't do anyone a favor when you hear someone... Uh, throw up on you as it were all this victimhood and no one loves me and no one cares for me call that out don't entertain that you're not being a good friend by listening to someone slander someone else it's a very poor friend when there's sin in our mission it'll always hinder that mission why do you think the left wants men to be addicted to laziness to video games to pornography because they know if that's the case He'll never be on his mission. Sin will entangle that man. Why do you think the world wants women to buy into the feminist movement? Because they know if they truly buy into it, that woman will never fulfill her mission on earth. 
Why do you think uh, that this world wants children to buy into the culture? Because they know these children will then become part of the culture, given to the sin of the culture, and they won't be the arrows that they were designed to be. So we need to truly confess our sin. In fact, let me just, in a sense, confess sin from the, bo- uh, the, 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 the broader Christianity that we find ourselves in in today's day and age. We need to confess that we have not taught families how to order their life. The church, by and large, has not taught men what it is to take true masculinity at heart, to truly take dominion. Uh, uh, the, the church at large has not instructed the female beauty that belongs to her in Christ. Now, by and large, we've turned the worship service sin- into a sinful entertainment service. Uh, we've turned the church into a man-pleasing, secur- uh, seeker-sensitive movement. We've rooted all of Christianity in ourselves rather than in the Word of God. We need to confess the sin that the church has not cared enough about politics or about the atrocious reality of abortion. We need to confess that. We need to confess that we've not taken all things under the lordship of Christ. We have not been the salt and light of this earth. In fact, we need to confess that we as Christians have forfeited our position as stewards of the earth and we've become subjects to the earth. Church, we're stewards of the earth. We're the kings and priests of the earth. And we need to confess that we've not done that as we ought. And we confess it because only then do we find prosperity. Only then do we find mercy. Only then is God in a position to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Don't cover this. Bring it to him. Christ already dealt with our sin. I love in Hebrews 12 it says, lay, uh, Let us also lay aside every weight of sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith we keep the mess we keep the sin it's a weight it entangles us we're trying to run the way, uh, the, the, the the race but we're entangled we're entangled it's weighing us down look to Christ and see all that fall off Look to Christ and see you literally shed all that weight as you look to Christ. Then you see your mission take off. Then you see see yourself become the man or the woman or the child that you've been called to be in the Lord. Blessed is he whose sin is covered, church, and whose transgressions are forgotten. What a blessing that is. What a blessing that we can hear a sermon about confession of sin and rather than walking out those doors with your head down, oh, I'm so sad because I'm just such a sinner. That's not the Christian life. What a joy that in a sermon that's not meant to convict you so that way you just uh, do a bunch of self-morbid introspection and, okay, Lord, uh, uh, is there sin in here? Is there sin in here? No, Lord, you search my heart to see if there's sin in there. And when there is, Praise be to God that he deals with your sin. And you could walk out of those doors having, having truly been consecrated to God, having uh, truly eaten with your, uh, your God, and you know the forgiveness of sins. That's the beauty of the Christian life. We don't hide our sins. We take it to God, and we walk out of here truly justified in him, having obtained mercy in him. And yet some of us in this room will still choose to cling on to our sin. All this blessing all this goodness, all of this hope, and we live in misery. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. When you hold on to your sin, you bring a charge against yourself. At least you attempt to. Church, we truly need to see that when we finally see sin for what it is, deal with that sin, confess that sin, that's when revival happens. In your heart, in your home, in your world. Die to sin and see the resurrection of Christ in every aspect of your life. Don't leave this room with your head down. No, leave this room looking up to the heavens and see the one who died for all your sin and know the forgiveness of that sin. Know the mercy for that sin. Why would anyone leave this room sad when you can leave this room full of joy? Because blessed is he whose sin is forgiven.